Hello, thank you for joining us for another session of dedication. Fans remember the Bay City Rollers. Hosted by Bay City Rollers Fan Events. I'm Suze and co-hosting with me is Laura. Hello, Laura. Hi, Suze. Good to talk to you again. You too. You too, always. Um, this week is part two of our amazing session um, with rock photographer Bob Gruen. Um, I'm excited to hear more of his stories, aren't you, Laura? I am. I really, really enjoyed that first part. Um, I have never heard an interview with him before. I, I knew about him and his body of work. And what I loved hearing about him is he photographed, I mean, people from every genre of music. And what I loved about him is that he really liked the music that he was um of the artist that he was photographing and there was no musical snobbery about him he really appreciated what what each each artist brought to the table and i really liked that about him yeah um it definitely was a big um a big interview for me personally because you know i'm a big fan um I, I just think he's amazing um but before we start um we'd like to give a big shout out and thanks to our friend carol um, Carol was the Bay City Rollers U.S. publicist and responsible for all this madness um, in the USA 45 years ago. She's such a good friend to us, and we really love her. Um, Carol was a panel guest at the 40th anniversary um, of the Bay City Roller fan events held in Philadelphia um, back in 2015. Um, you can also see um, footage of her presentation and the Q&A session over on YouTube. Um, I'll drop the links for that. Uh, she was a panel guest along with our friend Danny Fields, who was editor of Sixteen Magazine during those crazy years. Um, Carol and Danny and Bob were the trifecta of um, who were feeding us what we needed back then. <laughs> um, so should we just go on and, and uh, pick up where we left off? Absolutely. I can't wait to hear the second part. Okay, everyone. Here we go. Was that I made more money off the Bay City Rollers than any other band. I was going to ask. That was my next question. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were great for me because um, while I wasn't... It was funny. I was, uh, the publishers got me access. I don't think the Rollers themselves ever paid me. I didn't give them any pictures like for an album cover or an advertisement or anything like that. But I sold 80 pictures to tops, you know, uh, in the bubblegum cards. Uh, I, I, they didn't mm. have bubblegum cards for the Clash or even no, for the exactly. Maybe, maybe Beatles, but it was the only time I ever sold a set of pictures to uh, gum cards. Um, we might have done some Kiss ones, but not nearly as many. Um, but also, um, when I would go to a magazine, they would hire, they would maybe take two Rolling Stone pictures and maybe one Blondie picture mm -hmm. and 45 Bay City Roller pictures because they'd make a whole special issue. Yep. There was just Bay City Roller magazine. So it wasn't like a story in some other magazine. I mean, there was a lot of them, but there was a lot of just dedicated Bay City Roller magazine. Yeah, we wanted those pinups. So instead of selling two or three pictures, I was selling literally 40 or 50 to you know, a magazine. And for me, that was a huge payday. Mm. Um, huge in the sense that uh, more than I would usually make but since I was still kind of new in the business and I didn't I didn't know a lot about licensing uh, when you mention the cards that's always kind of a sticky point for me because uh, I did like 80 cards and I charged like one tenth of what I was supposed to charge because oh. uh, I, I didn't know you it didn't was know. a big deal to sell 80 at once you know and, uh, and get a check but when they called back a year later to relicense it, and the guy said, well, what'd you get last time? And I told him, he was like, oh, well, uh, we'll pay it. He paid me like 50% more instead That's of 50% less. Like usually the second printing you get less. Yeah. But when he heard how much I had charged, he said, oh, well, we'll give you more than that. <laughs> that well, that's funny. nice. You don't usually hear a nice story like that, do you? <laughs> no, no. But then, Good. but then it made me wonder when I found out what I should have charged, it was like, oh, this sticking point. Well, at that point, if I had gotten a too much money it probably would have hurt me in maybe like, they say it happens uh, yeah carrying on in the 70s. well we certainly uh, appreciated all those images i mean that's what we lived for you know we really did um well it's funny you know the kind of pictures i like to take uh capture the passion and the feeling in, of what's going on and not just the facts i mean some part would just photograph up the facts and you can see a guy with a microphone and what color shirt he's wearing but i want to get that moment when he's really doing it 
and you can feel like you're there. And you see, because for me, rock and roll is all about freedom. Mm-hmm. It's about the freedom to express your feelings very loudly in public. And certainly, that's what the basic role of fans got to do express their feelings very loudly in public. Well, and Bob, that's... And it's all about, for me, it's all about that moment when everybody's screaming yay, and I usually say that they're not thinking about paying their rent, but in this case, they weren't thinking about doing their homework, you know? Um, they weren't thinking about anything except screaming and having fun, and just letting, you know, it's kind of the, what was that therapy, the primal therapy, where you just scream and you just let, you know, everything out. And that's what happened at the, at the, you know, the rollers. And the kids could go home and they were exhausted and they weren't, you know, worried or thinking about anything else. And everything was okay when you yeah. just scream and let all your feelings out. We could probably use and more of that <laughs> nowadays. Well, there's a lot of people right now who really want to just scream and let it all yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, as an adult, it's hard to express that. I mean, you're right. It was it was a release, whatever we were feeling. That, that I mean, like I said, I, right. I wasn't a screamer personally, but I mean, I, I understood. Uh-huh. I I understood it because I I was I was internalizing it, so I was screaming inside. Right. If you know what I mean, <laughs> you know. Uh-huh. But it was but it was a release, and you did sleep for two days after a Bay City Rollers concert. <laughs> you know, it was you know you were exhausted right. after you were sweating. You were, there was no way <laughs> we looked good coming out of the Tower Theater. <laughs> there was no way. Right. Mad it with sweat and you know, but fun. But that's what your pictures did. Your pictures told the story. You know, mm-hmm. it told and it was you know we, we love them. I mean. Um, so you've done photo books on The Clash and Green Day. Um, would you ever consider doing um, a Bay City Roller photo book? Weed? Um, well, it's, you know, it's, it's complicated, like everything in life. Yeah. Um, and to get a publisher who, um, who would back something like that, I, I haven't found one. Yeah. Well, if you need uh, help with pre-sales, you know, just let me know. <laughs> okay. Because uh, the, the finances of, of printing your own books, yep. especially a photo book, uh, gets very expensive. Mm. You know, I mean, if the book costs 50 or $60 to print, you're not wow. going to be able to sell it for 30 you know? Right, absolutely. Um, and, um, I mean, I, you know, I have so many pictures. I mean, I would love to. I do a great book of Basic rollers. I mean, there's a bunch of bands that like to do Blondie, Kiss, uh, you know, things like that. But it's just hard to find a publisher who will take it. And if you don't have a publisher, distribution becomes a problem. Right. Uh, if you have to actually mail the books yourself, you know, you can't. You don't have a Hachette book distributor who's set up to get books into bookstores and to get them into Amazon and, and uh, you know move them around like that. It, it becomes very difficult to make your own book. It sounds easy. Every time you hear somebody say they did it, it just sounds like, oh, that must be simple, but it's not mm. simple. And it's not uh, economical unless, I mean, most of those books are vanity projects. Somebody who's printing their own book just wants to have a book and they're willing to not make any money on it. Um, right. But no, that, that's not that's not reality. And, and they don't just come together because I, I would have to make some money on it because it takes a lot of time actually to, edit everything to find everything to make um, scans nowadays you yep. know the old days we make prints and so on but now you have to make scans and it's not just a matter of putting it in a scanner or pushing a button because then you have to it's like the dark room work you have to enhance the picture you have to bring out the good you know dark and light qualities right and, um, and, and, and certainly there's always a lot of little spots of dust you have to clean up that can take hours for each picture so making a book is not as easy as just open the door, put some pictures in a file and send them off. It, it, it's a lot of work. And uh, I would love to, though, because, you know, I, I didn't take them for myself, and they're not doing me any good sitting in a file. Uh, I would love to have them out and have people enjoy them, but it's really just a, you know, financing problem. Yeah, that's too bad. Because there is definitely a market for it. It seems like there's a, a resurgent all of a sudden, you know, with, with the social media and, you know, people, you know, typing right. in whatever well, happened I'll, to. I'll look into it some more. I'll look into it some more and see what we can do. No pressure, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we'll, we'll, we have volunteers. We'll come to New York. Person, we'll help. You, you, the third person this month has mentioned that to me. Um, there's a radio DJ out in Minnesota. Uh, and we're doing an interview about my autobiography, and then she brought up, like, well, why don't you do a basic roller book? I'm like, really? You are one? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it's really nice to, to run into fans, because 
you know, at the time, it wasn't really taken seriously by the mainstream, but I thought it was very serious. All of these, you know, tens of thousands of kids so passionate that they'll make their own clothes and they'll show up and scream to exhaustion. Uh, there had to be so more and, than other bands. And they're still, a, a, I don't want to use the word rabbit, but they're still a very passionate live, you know, a base on you know social media still to this day. Wow. I mean, I have people that I used to write to as pen pals when I was 12 that I've met in person because of the Internet. Wow. You know, because oh, wow. that's wow. what we did also. That was how we, right. we, we were Facebook before Facebook was Facebook. We had pen pals right. from, from the back of 16 magazines and wrote to people all over the world. I mean, some days I would come home from school and there'd be 12 letters from Japan, Scotland, UK, Ohio. And, you know, I've met oh, really? I've met about four or five people that I wrote to as a young girl. And these were letters that you we went back and forth for years over, you know. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing. They've really, wow. um, they brought this amazing community and their friendships are what still keeps us together. Of course, we love the music. We love all getting together and celebrating that. But we're, we're friends and we're sharing real life together now. Uh, grandchildren, children, and it's just, it's just been a really wow. powerful and, and a beautiful experience. Um, yeah, we, we just love uh, each other. <laughs> it's, and I don't know, it, and I think that is kind of unique to this fan base. You know, and every day it, would, yeah, it just I gets think bigger. So. Well, because it, it was such a passionate. Mm -hmm. group. Yeah. And and we had so much fun, and we and it's fun to go back and and relive that. You know, every couple of years we get together somewhere. You know, whether it's Scotland or mm -hmm. New York, and we all hang out and you know talk about the old days and 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 share our lives that are happening today. It's it's really powerful. It's it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me because of the people that brought into my life. You know. Anyway, oh, um, yeah, but um, so I want to share a little personal story with you. Everyone who knows me for more than five minutes has heard this story. So sorry, everyone, you're going to hear it again. But I don't know if it was Atlantic City or Tower Theater, but you were very tall to me. I was 12 and you had this massive, beautiful, curly head of hair <laughs> that I could spot I, I, yeah, you. Uh, like, well, yeah, well, the, it was some big hair. It was some big hair. It's impressive. But while while the girls were chasing the limo, I I, w I wanted to talk to you, and I and I was like, you know, Mr. Gruen, I I want to do what you do. Tell me, give me give me some advice. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't quite say it like that, but that was the intent. Uh, and you told me to just have my camera with me at all times and to take pictures every day. And I've been doing that every yeah. day. And you've inspired yeah. me to do live music photography. I'm certainly nowhere in your league. <laughs> but it's my passion. And um, I, I love it. And I was wanting to ask oh. you if you tell me um, how you think live music photography has changed over the years. I mean, with the advent of digital and I mean, the gear itself. I mean, I'm 58 years old and I'm and I'm doing South by Southwest chugged down with all this stuff on my back, <laughs> you know. So um, how do you think uh, it's changed over the years? And if you could only take one lens to South by Southwest or any music festival or any concert, which lens are you taking? Well, I use the Canon cameras. Me too. And I have a lens. I have a lens I call my everything lens. Okay. And it's a 35 to 350. All right. I'm writing that down. <laughs> and uh, so basically the 35 is uh, wide angle. Yeah. And it's a zoom. that will just zoom through all the, the photo lengths until you get to 350, which is a very telephoto. Yeah. So I can be in front of a stage. I can get the entire stage and I can get a headshot of the singer or the drummer or anybody. All right. So just zoom right in. It's, it's, it's a heavy lens. And it's, um, you, you need some decent lighting. It's, it's not, you know. Not for low not light. Fast light. Yeah. Uh, it's not really for low light. Um, but once you get used to it, it's fantastic. Because like mm. I say, it's everything. It, it's every lens from 35 to 350. That's amazing. So what are we talking? What, what, do yeah. I got, what do I got to tell my husband? What are we talking, Bob? 2,000, 3,000? Uh, <laughs> it's been a while since I bought it. It's, it's probably going up. It's, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's an expensive lens. But it's I know. It's worth it, though. If you, only, if you can only take one, that, that's the one you'll take. There are Vivitar versions. Yeah. You know, the, the, the lesser price. Yeah, I've tried a couple. and lens. I don't get the sharpness from those. I, I've rented some, no, you know, from, from B&H. You don't get that sharpness. You, you get what you pay for. You do, absolutely. <laughs> that's true. Um, 
Well, that's the second great so, piece of advice you've given me, Bob. And I also once, uh, um, I crashed a photography club meeting on Long Island <laughs> um, that you were going to be a guest speaker. And I don't know how I got wind of it, but um, you were you were going to be their guest speaker. Oh, yeah, Huntington it was Huntington. And I, I called yeah, and I said, oh, you know, well, could I come? And they let me come. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, so I, I'm your fangirl, Bob. So be, be very afraid. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. no. I, I um, definitely... Uh, You've definitely been an inspiration for me, and I'm just so thrilled to talk to you today. Um, but before I let you go, I want you to um, tell me what was the last show you saw before shutdown. Oh, before shutdown? Do you remember? Um, we were in Brazil. I don't know if you call it a show. I had a, uh, an opening at a big museum in Brazil yeah. mm -hmm. uh, called the, the Museum of Image and Sound, and they put on a very elaborate John Lennon exhibit for me. It's all my pictures. But they arranged it so that uh, it was two floors, and about six or seven, I wouldn't even call them rooms, they were like viewing areas, because each room was so beautifully designed to go at that period. Um, even though I, I, I knew John for nine years, but there were different periods. Like, and, um, and for instance, I have some pictures of them walking in, uh, in the woods in Connecticut, some other pictures that they were walking in Central Park. And the museum built a round room, and they have astroturf in the middle, and faux trees around the walls, and the ceiling was a glowing uh, blue, which was actually a screen, and they showed uh, clouds and things on the ceiling. You know, uh, oh, Yoko's skywriting. Uh, I have some pictures when Yoko did skywriting uh, for Happy Birthday, John and Sean, mm. and they had that on the ceiling. And, and park benches, like four park benches around this circular room. So you would sit on a park bench and see John and Yoko, all these pictures of them in the woods and in the park, in a feeling of a, of, of a park. Wow. And another room when he was home with Sean and, and where Yoko asked where they had uh, just these gauzy white cutting the pictures. Um, and it was a very kind of calm and, you know, billowing curtains in the room mm. and they just took different, different inspirations from you know different parts of Lennon's life and it just made this amazing exhibit and my friend Supla who's one of the biggest rock stars in, uh, in Brazil one of the most well known um, he played at the opening um, and we actually had a fantastic month uh, before the shutdown but that was literally uh, the one week before the shutdown that was like Thursday night the opening and then I think we had another party uh, Friday, and then we came home Monday night, and uh, we went into New York Tuesday morning, and Friday we went upstate, uh, uh, luckily I've been renting a cottage in the Catskills, uh, and we went up there and just stayed up there mm. for months. Yeah. Uh, good, we're good coming show. back into the city now, just uh, one or two days a week, because uh, I'm getting orders for photo prints, I mean, that's how I make a living now, selling signed prints, and I have to come back in the city and sign them and send them out every week. Sure. Luckily, um, but you know we're trying to have as little contact, you know, publicly with anybody. Uh, but it was a great week. So Super, I think, was the last actual live show. Uh, he's kind of a punk rocker. He played a great version, punk kind of rock and version of Imagine and other John Lennon songs. Um, and actually, the night before we left to go to Brazil, we saw uh, Jane, was it, was it Jane Birkin. Elizabeth, it was Jane Birkin, right? Yeah, yeah, Jane Birkin, who had lived with Serge Gainsborough, was doing a concert with a Japanese um, conductor with an orchestra playing Serge Gainsborough songs, uh, mm -hmm. joined by uh, Charlotte Gainsborough, their daughter, and Iggy Pop. Whoa, okay. <laughs> at the Beacon Theater. And All it right. was amazing. It was, yeah, I mean, it, that was probably, and that was the last show we saw in New York that they both went to. And um, before that, uh, in the middle of the month, uh, Yoko Ono had a really great birthday party. Yoko Ono had a birthday for the 18th. Um, I know we saw Debbie somewhere. I think Debbie did a, a talk about her book at Town Hall. Um, Iggy did another show that was just the Iggy show. Um, it was a great month. It just was like every other day we were going to see somebody, and then all of a sudden it just I know. Like somebody put up or laid a wall or something. Yeah, I, I, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I understand it totally. Um, I don't want to go to a, lot, a a room full of people right now. Right. Absolutely. Uh, 
but most of my friends are musicians and they're all hurting because, uh, you know, my friend, uh, one of my friends is Jesse Mallon. Uh, oh, I know I Jesse. He finished a tour where it, it was his first sold out tour in theaters in Europe and he was coming back for a, another month and you know, I think uh, a three and a half week tour and he was bringing my son as his opening act my son Chris Gruen is a singer and songwriter oh and wow he was uh, going to go to Europe with, he, had a, he had his plane ticket it was like two weeks from when they were, they were leaving at the end of March oh. and, uh, and I, so it was like a week before they were going was when they shut down but Europe was already closed before that yeah so um, and it's just on hold and, and these people have nowhere to go so I don't feel I'm missing anything because there's nothing happening right you know? no there's right no shows to miss um, yeah, Jesse's done very well actually with a TV, you know, the, a virtual thing. He's on every week. He yep. does a lot of concert every week. Yeah. Um, and he brings on guests and so on. He's doing really well. Yeah, but and they have people, to. They, 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 the video format just doesn't really fit, and for me, it's not the same being in a crowd. Of no, you got to have someone spill beer on you. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if that was the good part or not, but it does happen. I remember it was like. Especially at a Rolling Stones concert, we had these drunks just slashing beer on us the whole show. It was horrible. But, um, or, you know, or, you know, at night we were at a stadium show and it's raining, pouring rain, another Rolling Stones show. Um, but there's the experience, and you, you can never duplicate that. And sitting in the living room watching a video of it, or even a live video, it's just not the same. It, it, really it, have. Yeah. I, mean, I, I do a lot of you know, Zoom calls and stuff, but it's. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's a real disease. You have to take it seriously. You can't say it doesn't exist. There's people dying every day. A lot of people. Exactly. And, um, yeah, I, mean, I find okay. that the, um, the the you know the live videos they're helping a little bit, and you know I, I make sure I tip I tip the tip jar, and I'm a folky like you are, so you know my artists are you know it, it it works better if you're that kind of an artist. I know Lyle Lovett's doing some really great concerts for ten bucks, and it'll be him with uh, someone. He did Dwight Yoakam one year, uh, one month, and um, coming up I think on the eleventh he's with um, Elvis Costello. I mean, for ten bucks for me to sit there, it's like it, it's it's good enough right. for now, you know. Um, right. So right. I, I do. Is right. They get some money. Right. Exactly. Uh, and it's great for them. I mean, uh, you know, Jesse, he's got like a thousand people around the world. I uh, would just anything. He can play one show and instead of being in Liverpool or Philadelphia or whatever. Yep. He, he can be can, everywhere. He's got people from Japan to Germany. Exactly. Oh, so the same time watching it, and that, that's pretty really fascinating to play for the world instead of just a city it is but you're right it's not the same i want to smell the smells i want to i want that bump 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 in my heart <laughs> from the right. bass you, you know i want it all yep but someday yeah, soon you want to come home sweaty and you don't get that you look no um so has there is there anyone that you haven't photographed that you wish you did uh well it goes back i mean uh, actually i always wish i could have met uh, otis redding oh yeah i was a huge fan and uh, devastated when he passed away yeah, uh, a couple of people like that, uh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, but I, I met him briefly. You know, I saw him in person, but I never got to have a photo session, which would have been cool. Um, but nowadays, no, there's not. Any, I'm really. Uh, I, I find a, a lot of the modern music very derivative because mm -hmm. there's so much available to you know study and, and in the sense of seeing any show that ever existed on YouTube, any anything you've ever heard of, you can go and watch. Um, and so you know you see a lot of combinations of things uh, it's, for me it started in the 80s when kids started saying oh yeah I left home I took my dad's records uh, I, I would give people copies tapes of my records I would never let people take my records but uh, things started getting really derivative like this band is a, they're, they're like Motley Crue with an Alice Cooper kind of singer um, <laughs> but when I saw Alice Cooper, there was nobody like him. No. He well, wasn't like anybody. Tina Turner wasn't like anybody, you know? Yeah. Um, well, that's the thing. Like, who um, are the next fill in the blank? I don't, I don't see that. I mean, there are some people that I am excited about. World. Yeah, I mean, we've lived in the best times musically, you know? And when they invent that time machine, we're going to go back and photograph Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> uh, right. We're going well, back. I'm going days, with you. <laughs> Like back then, there was there was limited radio. There was like maybe two. I mean, I'm in New York, so we had several, two or three radio stations playing rock and roll. But most cities had one. Yeah. In England, you just had the the pirate stations. You exactly. Know, to hear rock and roll, whereas now 
the entire catalog of world music that ever existed is that's available to everybody at your fingertips anywhere. instantly yep it's it's definitely and different so that's very different you know that um you know rock and roll has evolved into hundreds of genres yeah you know, i mean heavy metal is like 15 kinds of thrash metal and emo metal and death metal and whatever, you know, and, and that's a subdivision of rock and roll. There's millions of them. But even though they have all that, they don't have a Rolling Stone. They don't have a Lennon. They yeah, don't, have... don't have... a central... You don't have, a, you don't have a, everybody listening to the same station. Right. There's no real connection to it, I don't think. So that, you know, certain people could build a, a huge following like that. Now... It's so diverse. Everybody's got a little problem. Yeah, they got a little bit of each. Not a little, but little compared to the world. What? It, world yeah, stones exactly. Yeah. Phenomenon. Well, I kind of feel bad for them, don't you? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is what it is. It is know? what I mean, it is. My granddaughters are happy with what they got. They're enjoying music, but it's different from what I did. But I remember that my grandfather was very different from me, so I don't expect it to be the same. Is there anyone today that that you know excites you who do you think's doing it right um, well there was a band called the stripes but like typically um they they, uh, they actually got together when they were six they were kids who started playing in their neighborhood i saw them when they were 16 and they were amazing but by the time they were 20 they were ready to break up they've been together 14 years of it <laughs> wow where were they from um, uh, they're from Ireland. They're oh. called, uh, the Stripes, S T R Y P E S. Oh, Stripes! I'm thought, I thought I thought you said Stripes. Stripes. Yeah. Okay. No, um, they were they, you know nice young kids in a sense. Um, you know, similar to the, the Rollers in the sense of being you know polite, young, passionate rock and roll musicians. Um, you know, not they, they weren't the obnoxious, rebellious kind. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, I mean, that was one of the things that was nice about the the Rollers is that they were nice, nice you know, boys. That, uh, uh, the music I felt was very exciting. It was obviously you know uh, passionate and sexual as rock and roll should be, um, but in a uh, you know not in a, a dark way in any sense because it was all fun. It was you know kind of the onset of puberty kind of fun. You know, sure, it was, it was very, very exciting, innocent, but not you know. Uh, yeah, innocent. That's mm -hmm. the it was. I mean, it kept me young longer, if if that makes sense, because I had friends in junior high school who were going yes. in different directions that maybe I wasn't ready for. So I still had that comfort, that you know, that security blanket of the rollers where they, they, they were safe. Yeah. yeah were oh safe. yeah. Yep. Yeah, definitely safe. You know, you you. Yeah, they were safe and lovely. I mean, it, it, it didn't. It didn't look like they wanted to meet you in a motel later. Exactly. Or just to have fun at the show, let it all out. Maybe and hold hands. Maybe hold hands. Maybe. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and oh. that didn't really happen much. Tam, Tam definitely kept, there was no fans allowed on the floor. Uh, I remember at one concert, I met some kids um, who were a little older and uh, came back with me. Uh, they were actually New York Dolls fans and... Uh, when Tam saw a girl walking out of the elevator, he said, not on the floor. You're not allowed. Um, and he gave me an ultimatum, actually. He said, you know, if you want to be with your friends, you can get a, a room on a different floor, or you can tell them to go home. And I didn't want to leave the band. You know, I didn't yeah. want to have that kind of stigma. I said, well, I'm following the band rules. And, uh, and so my friends went home. Mm. That's kind of bizarre and kind it of a shame because because they were young boys. They should have been able to enjoy the fruits of their labor. <laughs> Not not well, with us young girls, but, you know, they yeah. should have been able to well, socialize with females. I'm sure, they, I'm sure they did, you know, when they weren't on tour. But on tour, you had a strict, you know, you're in a band, you do what the band does, and you don't get anybody else in the band in trouble. Yeah. Well, he obviously knew what he was doing. They they had some wild success, didn't they? Well, yes, they did. More, yeah. than, more than anybody did yeah. at the time. Bob, thank you so much. This has been such a treat for me personally, and I'm sure our listeners are going to really be happy with it too. All right, well, my pleasure. Thank you. Wow, that was just wonderful. Definitely for me on a personal level. And I'm sure you all found Bob very engaging and interesting. I think he needs to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, like now, don't you? 
Again, we want to thank Carol for booking the session for us. Carol is very, very good to the Bay City Roller fan community from 45 years ago to today. Carol, we love you. Thanks to everyone for listening, especially when Bob and I, you know, kind of talk shop. <laughs> there were several minutes um, that I actually forgot I was recording a podcast and I just wanted to pick his brain. It was just incredible. Until next time, keep on rolling.